Well, if you're a Christian, you probably know what it is to have a close, personal, intimate relationship with your Father in Heaven. And that's an awesome thing, to be sure. And for a lot of us, that relationship with God may be so close that we don't even think or imagine what our lives were before we entered into right relationship with God. Almost to the point, for some of us, where we might think that this is the kind of relationship that we've had with God all the time. But I think deep down we know better. What does the Bible actually say our relationship was with God before we came to Christ? It's very interesting. It's, I think that the way the Bible terms this is in a, ter- in a way that not a lot of us think about and maybe a lot of us don't even know. And that's the purpose of this podcast, to open our eyes to some of the things that Scripture says. So we're pausing from the book of Acts to take another, another look at the aspect of the gospel, and we're going to be looking at reconciliation. We're going to be looking at some wonderful things, and we're going to be looking at a before picture and an after picture, our lives before Christ and our lives after Christ as it relates to this one concept of reconciliation. We're in for some great things. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Well, before we before we delve in here, and like I said, I think we're going to be looking at some um, some good things uh, today. Um, I want to, I want to just share something with you, um, that's kind of not related. I just, and I didn't share this, um, I didn't share this last week, uh, just because I, I didn't want to take up a lot of time. There was, um, just some introductory things I wanted to say before giving you into the sermon piece and everything. And, um, so I just kind of limited the last week's podcast episode to that, but, um, I want to share this with you. Um, and it really has no... Uh, sort of resolution to it or anything like that of, of what what I've seen in my life um, over the last week or two. Um, but we'll see where it goes. And it's kind of gotten me to think about future directions of this podcast, um, just as far as some of some future things that we would want to talk about. Um, nothing is set in stone, but um, it's interesting. Let me just start with the specifics um, of this. Uh, a couple of weekends ago, I was I was in Kansas and I was um, I was talking to a friend of mine um, down there, and we were you know we were we were talking about all sorts of things, and um, uh, we were talking about ministry um, and just kind of what ministry looks like and everything. And one of the things that I said was um, that uh, that when wherever if God in His will uh, places me in a church to pastor. Uh, that one of the first things that I would do um, would be to start out, you know, initially in starting to preach through the book of First Timothy, um, for various reasons. And I'll need to go into the details as to as to why why that is. Um, and it's interesting because this friend of mine and another guy uh, who's a friend of mine, um, I wasn't he wasn't there at this meeting, but I was just talking to his friend. They recently p- uh, planted a church. And um, after some preliminary messages over the over the first months of that church's existence, um, they're starting or they're going to start. I don't know if they started already, but uh, they're going if if not, then they're going to very soon going to start preaching through First Timothy. And I was there at their at their launch um, at their launch. They meet on on Sunday evenings. And I said that's in they said just kind of give a forecast of some of the things that they'd be talking about in future messages. And they said that they would um initially start preaching through first Timothy. And I said, that's interesting. Um, I've always thought that if I, whenever I pastor somewhere, unless the Lord leads me to talk about something else, the first, the first thing I'd want to do is, is preach through first Timothy, um, mainly because it, it really lays out w- what God expects the church to be, um, and what expects his leaders to be, you know, which I would be one of them, obviously. So it'd be a way of telling my congregation, this is what scripture says about the, the type of person that I should be in and, and everything. But anyway, uh, and when we were, when I was talking to my friend, um, it's interesting. Uh, he, he asked me about first Timothy two, and he asked, you know, just curiously, what, what are your thoughts of of women pastors uh, or women elders? Um, how do you see that whole that whole debate? What where do you, what side do you land on? Um, and so I I uh, I I spoke about wh- wh- where I landed on that, and then I asked him where do, where does he stand because we'd never talked about this before, and 
he and he said that that he was on the other side. And so this is the first time that I that me and my friend I, I had ever really, to my recollection, really had had differed on um, on how to look at a particular passage, a, 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 a particularly a passage of of great debate, I guess. Um, and we talked it over, and I don't I don't want to show my cards here or anything, um, that because that's not the issue here. Um, uh, but you know, we we spent a good amount of time just kind of talking and discussing it, um, and, and and that sort of thing. Which a side note, by the way, because he, my friend, kind of made this uh, made this comment um, at the end of our, our at the end of our talk, and I thought it was really good. Is that uh, he appreciated how we could talk about and and talk through these things, even though we we now see that we disagree on something, but we can talk about it civilly and still remain friends. Uh, you know, at the at the end of it. And um, and just as a side note, I I just want to say that that's something that I wish um, I just wish all Christians could learn to do because uh, because topics like that and other top and, and other um, uh, topics of, of scripture that are of high debate that doesn't happen very often and um, very much to our spiritual detriment, by the way. And one of the things that he said which I'd heard somebody else say to me one time when I was in, when we were talking about things that we disagreed on. And one of the things that he said was that this is this, this, even though we, we, we disagree talking through these things, uh, sharpens me. Um, and so I, it sharpens me too. And so I just wish that people would see it more like that than, than anything else. But anyway, that's just a side note. Um, but you know, it was just interesting that that sort of thing came up in conversation. And then later on that week, I was meeting with um, a pastor who's getting ready to retire um, and his wife and somebody else from the church um, at his house. Um, I had kind of been thinking about the possibilities of, of taking over as pastor there. Uh, um, and uh, we were, I was just kind of checking things out with him and just talking through um, some certain things. Um, and it's interesting um, that in the course of conversation, um, this man's wife um, asked me, just just asked me. <laughs> uh, says, so what's your what's your opinion on uh, women pastors or women preachers? Um, and it turns out, and I told her how I how I felt and everything. But there again was this um, this bringing up of this question about about women about women and pastors or or women preachers or women in the ministry and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, I, again, I went into what I believe the, scri the, the scripture said about that. Um, and there was disagreement there, too. The disagreement on the other side was kind of the argumentation was a little bit different than what my friend had. Um, but anyway, that's that's we don't need to get into that. But um, and then uh, that following weekend, I was uh, I was sitting down. I was having breakfast with a friend of mine here in town. Um, where I live, and uh, we were just talking about stuff, you know, uh, and we, we have great conversations, um, you know, whenever we get together um, about various things, and uh, I forget what we were talking about, but there was a, it, it kind of served as a, as a segue for him to kind of ask me that same question. He says, speaking of, speaking of that, I, I, I want to ask you something, um, and, you know, just based on where the conversation had come from, I, 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 kind of had a feeling I knew what, what the question was going to be. Uh, <laughs> but um, he said, what's your opinion? What's, what's your, what's your thoughts about, about women pastors and, and women preachers? And when he was asking that, I just, I just chuckled. I just laughed out loud. And I said, you know, you're the third person within a week uh, to ask me this, this question. Um, and unlike the other two, uh, I when I explain what I, what I thought Scripture said about that or how to understand passages like First Timothy two and things like that, uh, unlike the other two, he was one who kind of agreed who, who agreed with me, even though he still kind of struggled with some things as far as how to look at some passages and um, and things like that. But uh, he was more along the lines of what I believe Scripture says about that, and so. I don't know. It's just it's just interesting. I mean, just independent. These are all people who are independent of each other. None of these people are connected to anyone else in any sort of way. Um, and so it, it kind of made me think, I wonder if God's preparing me for something. Um, I am, you know, just based on the first conversation that I had with my friend in Kansas, um, 
he's he's very eager and and I am eager as well to kind of look into things and kind of continue the conversation um, on this matter. I just recently ordered a book um, that's written from the perspective of the other side, the the disagreement side that I have. Um, and, you know, just going to take a look at it, see what kind of merits it has uh, about it. Um, this is a, a book that my friend recommended to me um, and everything. But here's the thing. I wonder if God is trying to get me to look deeper into these things so that, um, uh, so that uh, you know, maybe he can show me something where there's something different, where I look at things differently. As it stands right now, I look at Scripture and I think Scripture can't be more plain. Uh, but I'm willing to have an open heart and an open mind about things. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, go into this whole thing and I read the other perspectives. And it's not like I'm not familiar with what the other perspectives say. But, I mean, you know, even with the opposition side, there's different angles that people come at it through. And, you know, read it and see what it says. Um, my mind not be cha- might not be changed, but then again, it might. So maybe that's one one thing. I, I I definitely think that God is trying to is trying to get me to move towards something. I mean, just as far as looking at this a little bit deeper and everything there. So it might be that where He's trying to get my mind to shift on something, um, to something that's more biblical than what I'm thinking right now. Or, um, it might be where He is preparing me, um, to take a firmer stand, um, on what I already stand on and what I already believe, um scripture to be saying and trying trying to establish me with more with a more firm footing um on what i believe the bible says because maybe there's somewhere down the road where i'm going to staunchly have to stand up for that in some certain context whatever that is i don't know and all i'm all that i'm saying here is is pretty speculative so i don't even know if these are the things that god is is preparing me for me to do um but it's just interesting how all of that is has has rolled out. Now, as it relates to this podcast, and I was uh, I was I was mentioning to the pastor at our church just kind of how weird it is uh, how these three instances came up, and so it, it kind of got me ta- thinking about. And I mentioned this out loud just how interesting it is, to, you know, where there's different things um, where there's where there's such uh, uh, debate and disagreement on sometimes hostily and other times maybe not so much. Um, but, you know, we th- talk about women in ministry. And then I thought, you know, different perspectives on tongues, um, second coming issues, um, uh, eternal security, you know, uh, election, you know, all these things where people have debated these, th- these things for so long. And I thought after that conversation with my pastor, I'm like, I wonder if down the road, what it, what it would look like to have a series of weeks where we, where we just kind of hash out these controversial issues, uh, including women in ministry. Uh, well, not women in ministry. I mean, women can be in ministry. I want to be a little bit more narrower than that. Women pastors um, and everything. I, I think that's really where the where the where the debate lies. Um, uh, so you know, including that topic, including um, including second coming, including tongues. You know, what would it look like? I, and so I just this just kind of been loosely rattling through my mind. It's not anything that I would think of doing soon, like in the next um, week or so, or two or three or, or so weeks. I mean, obviously we have a lot to get through with the book of Acts, um, and then with some other weeks in between there, um, and looking at the aspects of the gospel, I don't want to interrupt that. Um, but it's just something that's loosely running through my head. If you have any opinions on, on it, well, feel free to to hit me up on Twitter and just tell me what you think, um, by the way, which is at LT Scripps. Um, loving the scriptures on Twitter. Um, so, um, so anyway, yeah, it's, I just, I just felt like I should share that. It's just interesting. You just with those three and listen, that hasn't for that particular topic that's never happened. And for any other topic of conversation, any sort of theology or doctrine that's never happened to me before with like within, within days of each other, uh, independent, three, three independent people ask me the same question about a particular theological issue. Um, <laughs> You know, so um, I don't know. That's the that's a first for me. So we'll we'll see um, what goes on with with everything like that. So anyway, enough of that. Um, let's get into uh, talking about reconciliation. Um, and reconciliation is really a um, a beautiful thing to to think about. 
um, a, a lot of all the things having having to do with the gospel is, is are wonderful are wonderful things to think about. Um, but I guess right with the thing with reconciliation um, is that uh, is that reconciliation re- involves the whole thing about uh, about being brought back into into relationship with God, right relationship with God. Um, and I guess maybe that the whole the underlining the whole word word right relationship um, is is uh, is necessary because even with people who aren't Christians, um, I guess you could say technically that they do have a relationship with God. It's just not a good one, <laughs> you know. Just like there, just like in marriages, there are good marriages and there are bad marriages, um, that sort of thing. And, and that's not to say that unbelievers can can take the claim of being the bride of Christ, but they're just in a bad marriage. I'm not saying that, um, but it's just that, uh, you know, your uh, what somebody does with Christ determines what kind of relationship you have. Everybody has a relationship of some sort, uh, but with Christians, there is a deep, loving, intimate relationship uh, with God the Father, but those outside of Christ have a not so good relationship. And really, that's that's a good place that that's a good place to start our analysis on this whole thing, um, because we we have to ask the question: Okay, for those people who are outside of fellowship with Christ, or even if we think about it on more personal terms of where what we were before we came to Christ, what does the Bible say about who we were and what what kind of relationship we had? with God before we came to Christ. What what is it that the Bible actually says? And so that's is yeah, I mentioned before that this is kind of going to be a before and after sort of thing. We look at the before and after. If you if you remember, and if you were um if you were with us um in the six weeks that we spent um and when we took a break, that six week break from looking at the book of Acts, um and we spent six weeks looking at the gospel, just kind of like the progressive flow of the gospel. Um, you know, if you if you remember that, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time looking at the before picture of that, of that as well, but it's kind of in a different form than what I want to look at now. Um, and so um, where I want to start off, and I think actually the best place to start off and to actually kind of look at what this whole thing with reconciliation is and the things beforehand, before we were reconciled to God through Christ, um, is um, a, a couple of verses that we want to look at in Colossians 1. So that's where I'm going to draw from. And um, in Colossians 1, um, I think Paul makes a very good statement Um just as far as, um, uh, you know, this kind of the before and after um, uh, as it relates to reconciliation. And so in Colossians chapter one, um, I'm going to read this section here, which is verses 21 through 23. I'm just going to read all of that just because I, I think most of that is all one sentence, so I don't want to stop mid-sentence, but the, the emphasis is going to be on, on verses 21 and, and 22. Okay, so this is Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, and it says, um, and this is Paul speaking, he says, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all cre- in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Um, so, um, that kind of sounded funny when I read that there. But in verse twenty one, I mean, initially it says, "And and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he." has now reconciled in his body he has now reconciled in his body uh, of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and I guess he's reconciled us I guess is is what is how we should take that so there's that bringing together and the he there in that passage is Christ okay so it talks about um, you know, being brought together by the death of Christ, um, reconciled in his Christ's body of flesh by his death. And so what makes reconciliation possible, obviously, um, is the death of Christ. Um, and that's something that Paul says here in, in this 
passage in Colossians chapter 1. Um, he also says that in Romans chapter 5. I think we'll take a look at, a quick look at Romans a little bit later. Um, but take note here, first of all, um, of what he starts out with in this passage here, where he says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. So he says, this is what you were. This is, and so this is the before, okay? He says, you who were alienated. Now let's, let's, let's stop there and, and, and take that for a moment. You who once were alienated. So what do we think of when we think of, of alienation? I mean, we, we think of separateness, you know, set, you know, secluded away from, you know, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, if you think of it along, along human terms, we think about people who are alienated from a person or from a group of people. People who are on the outside, there's not a togetherness there. There's a, there's a separation. There's an estrangement. They're alienated from one another. And so Paul is saying that that was what we were. And of course, that's nothing. That's that's something that I think that we're very familiar with. You know, the Bible says that that our sins have separated us from God. I believe that's in Isaiah chapter uh, 59 where uh, where it talks about that. And, you know, whenever we talk about the gospel, you know, just really in, in general terms, we, we understand and we might state and we might proclaim that our sins have, have separated us from God. What is that separation? That's just another way of, of, uh, of saying alienation. We were alienated. You know, we sin and God, think of it like this. Um, here's a good way of, of thinking about it. And again, we want to look at this on relational, uh, uh, from relational terms, uh, in relational terms. In the very beginning, uh, when uh, we're talking about Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden and, and that sort of thing, um, we could say before sin entered into the world, before the first sin took place, right, you had, uh, you had Adam and Eve who had perfect harmony, perfect fellowship, perfect relationship with the God who created them, right? And they were living in the Garden of Eden. They were living in a paradise. Everything was perfect, and then when Eve ate of the fruit and then gave some to Adam, there was the sin that happened because God had told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Which they did. And immediately when they, when they, took, uh, when they, took, uh, when they took part of eating from that tree, um, they felt shame. They noticed that they were naked and they felt shame. And when God came and walked in the garden in the cool of the day, they hid themselves so they're they're in a, in a very small way as this kind of this uh, this hint of alienation, this separateness. Because you know you can look at it in two ways. Um, one way is is God is is man running away from God, and that's what we see with Adam and Eve. Because when when God approached God, they, Adam and Eve hid themselves, uh, which is interesting um, because I, I don't think it was. You know, Adam says it was because of their nakedness, but they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves. So what are they what are they so ashamed of if they have coverings for themselves and then God comes and then they they, they feel like they need to hide? It's more than just a nakedness issue in my mind when I read that text. Um, there's something else going on. They realize that something is deeply, deeply wrong. And you know what? God realizes that something is deeply, deeply wrong. That's why he's coming and asking that question in the garden, where are you? You know, when Adam and Eve hid. Um, and when God asked that question, he's not asking that as if, you know, he's, he's looking around saying, I can't find them anywhere. Um, it's, it's, a way, it's the beginning steps of trying to bring them back. Now, of course, with Adam and Eve, it didn't work out. They start playing, uh, playing the blame game. And so what happens after after the Lord lays forth the curses, both uh, to to uh, to Adam, to Eve, and to the serpent, He kicks them out of the garden. And so there's the other side of that too, where there's that alienation where God says, "Away, go away." Um, you know, you are no longer in uh, allowed in this garden. And so there's this. You get the sense that from both sides, there's this rift uh, between God and man. Okay. And that's what and that's what scripture says. There's this rift between God and man um, because because of sin. Sin has separated us. And so because of the curse, when Adam and Eve procreate and, you know, just from them, 
all the way through, through all human beings that have ever existed and do exist and will exist in human history, um, there is that, that uh, we're born in sin, right? Because we're, we're born with a sin nature, and we've talked about that before. We don't have to go into deep detail about that, but we're born in sin. We're born spiritually dead. And you remember, if you remember what I said or how I define spiritual deadness, uh, spiritual deadness, when somebody's spiritually dead, they're dead to God and to the things of God. They're not responsive to the things of God. They go their own way. So there's that there's that separation there, alienation because of because of sin. Right. So that's uh, so that's so that's what you have there. And, of course, we know that God, who is a holy God, cannot have intimate fellowship with people who are steeped in their sin. And, again, that's something else that we talked about uh, before, too. So you kind of see how, how some of these concepts are just kind of, uh, are, are kind of intersecting, uh, are, are, are intersecting together just as we look at this, these things and we just kind of unfold uh, some of the things that the, that, the Bible, that the Bible says here. So there's so alienation is just this this whole thing of, of separation. There's a separation between uh, between God and man. Okay, now there's more to it though than just this uh, than just alienation. And again, if we look back in Colossians chapter one, again you see, as you see in verse twenty one, it says, "And you who once were alienated and listen to this and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds." Okay. Now, in the ESV here, the, the whole thing of hostile and hostile in mind. Um, in the Greek, the word in the Greek has the, the meaning of that word is, is um, somebody who is an enemy. Okay. And I believe it's the NIV who actually comes out and uses that word. It may also show up in the, I want to say the New King James Version. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. But some translations, let's just say that some translations actually have that word enemy in there and that's really the 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 meaning that you can draw from the original language from greek um which obviously i mean it's it's not saying that there's a wrong translation between those and what i'm reading here from the esv because implied in the whole thing of an enemy is somebody who is hostile towards that person of whom they are of whom they are an enemy of right so there's so you think about enemies all over the place even in in the real world even in the fiction world um, Batman and Robin are enemies, right? They're not, they're not friends at all, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, that, that, that might not be a great example just as far as plugging, in, pl- plugging it into the theology of things here. But again, what we have to understand is that, there are, uh, that, that there's an enmity uh, between, between God and man. And that really is what we have to understand what our relationship was before we came to Christ. So here that the, the, the answer to that question of what was our relationship with God like before we came to Christ, before we entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ and accepted and, 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 and submitted to him and repented and came to him by faith, what, would, what defined our relationship? Because I don't think it's technically correct to say that our relationship was non-existent. The harmony, the good relationship was non-existent, but there was a relationship there. And what was that relationship? That relationship that we had with God was a relationship of enmity. And we are enemies of God again. And that's something else that 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 uh, that uh, Paul says in Romans um, in Romans chapter five, uh, that we were enemies of we were enemies of God. And so and, and so just looking at here in this in the, in the whole thing with the in um, in my translation here in the ESV it says hostile in mind. OK, now um, that term hostile or even if we take the word enemy might throw you for a loop, just depending on depending on your personal testimony and your story before you came to Christ. Right. Um, there are some people who that will, are Christians now um, who will tell you that their view of God is before they came to Christ was one that was very um, vitriolic. It was very, uh, they, they had a, a, a conscious, um, they, they had a conscious hatred for God. They knew in their minds, this wasn't anything that was on an unconscious level or anything like that. They, 
uh, if they had a if if God had a face, a physical face, and of course He doesn't, because I mean Christ does. But I mean, if we're talking about God the Father or whatever, you know, he, if God the Father had a face, a physical face, and these people had an opportunity to spit in it, they would. That's kind of some people might have have had that that conscious hatred and dislike for for God. Now, listen, you you look if you ever run into any sort of street pe- street preacher or somebody who's out boldly uh, in a loud voice declaring the things of God and proclaiming the gospel, you're going to see some hostility. Right. I've seen that, you know, in college uh, when I was in college, I've seen that from time to time when people on campus, you know, from time to time you had traveling people who would come and and they would and they would stand in the free speech zone and they would declare the things of God and they declare the gospel and they would draw a crowd and uh, you had people who were shouting objections to him um, not so much saying hey shut up we don't want to hear you sort of thing but you had people who who put their boxing gloves on and say you know you are out of your mind this is the problem that I have with you this is the problem I have with your religion this is the problem that I have with the God that you say that you worship right so you so so when you bring up anything about God they them for a lot of people's like them them's fighting words. I uh, I remember a, a, a one young lady in college who was uh, um, who you know her hostility toward God and toward the things of God was was very evident. She she, she never tried to t- tried to hide it, and even she even if she did try to hide it, I don't think she'd do a good job of that just because of the the animosity that she had. I never got deep into why she felt that way. Um, and I don't think I never really would really even have to. I mean, you it's just a, um, uh, a a natural overflow of the sinfulness that's in somebody's heart and the natural um, animosity that somebody might have towards God. Even if you look at places like Romans one, one of the descriptions that Paul gives of sinful man is that he is a hater of God. Now, think about this. We think about enemy. We think about hostility. And we think about haters of God and we think about people like that. Maybe you know some people in your own lives who kind of display that sort of attitude. They're like, oh, God, I hate God. And, and you know, and if you bring anything up about God, they, they instantly start yelling at you. And, uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll push you to the limits as far as asking you questions. They try and trip you up, you know, that sort of thing. There are people who will acknowledge, who are, who are Christians now, who will acknowledge, they look back and they say, that's the kind of person that I was. So when you read something like this about hostility, um, they, they say, yeah, I, I totally get it because I, I was that person before. But then there's other people who will look at this and they'll think enemy and they'll think hostility. They'll think hater of God and they'll think, well, wait a minute. I don't think that that was really me. I mean, I really didn't know much about God to, uh, you know, for enough for me to actually hate him. You know, some people, you know, might have had this thought that before they came to Christ, they were just kind of, uh, they were just kind of neutral about things. And if you remember from several, several weeks back when we were talking about the gospel, one of the things that I told you is that in the, in this, in the realm of spirituality, there is no neutrality. There is no such thing as neutrality. You're either with Christ or you're against him. Okay. You're either on his side or you're against his side. There is no in between. There's no fence straddling of any kind uh, when it comes to something like this. Uh, which might, which again, will go against what a lot of people thought of what their, what, what, you know, what their attitude was before they came to Christ. So they think hostile. They think, well, I wasn't one who cursed God. I wasn't one who yelled at Christians. I wasn't one who, uh, who had this inner hatred toward God. But let's, let's think about what this, what this passage says here in Colossians. Okay. In, in this whole thing with, in, in, where it says, and hostile in mind. Um, let's take that, because, because Paul looks at this in two, in two ways. Hostile in mind, and then doing evil deeds. And I, and I believe that those two things are very much linked together. Okay, let's not separate those two things here. Let's bring those t- the two things together. Because one thing that you have to understand is that the sin that is expressed outwardly, first and foremost, has its beginnings from within. Okay, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, suggests as much. So again, for example, I know we've talked about this before, but for but again, when it comes to murder, murder wasn't just its own independent act. It started with anger in the heart. 
which Jesus said is the same thing as murder. It might not in all situations lead to the physical act of murder, but we're talking about anger and hatred and that sort of thing. It's that's something that's from the inside and works its way out. So it's very interesting. I think that that's the same thing that you're seeing here in Colossians alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. Okay. Now, hostile in mind or being an enemy in the in the mind is 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 sort of it, it's kind of in along the lines of um hostile in the way that you think about god and to the things of god um if you remember uh you know in talking about the holiness of god and how a lot of people try and make god out to be just like them but then when they find out who god really is and what he's really uh, what he's really like they say, um, that's not my God. And so really what they've done is they've shaped a God in their own image, a God that looks a lot like them and saying, this is the God that I, that I want to worship. So what do you have there? Really what you have there uh, is a situation where somebody is not thinking right about the, the true God of the Bible. So let's use the popular one of, of, you know, if somebody has a problem, has an issue with a God, the God of the Bible being a God of wrath. And they say, no, he's not a God of wrath. He's all loving. He's all kind. He's, he's, he's all those things. But he's, he's not a God of judgment. He's too loving for that. That's really a hostile way of looking at God. Because what, what one person would be saying if they say that is that I don't like the God of the Bible that's presented to me. Because you can't deny, if you're familiar with Scripture, you can't deny the fact that God is a God of wrath, both in the Old and the New Testament, right? So in mind, somebody has a view of God that is hostile toward what, what Scripture actually reveals about who God is, okay? And so when somebody presents to them the real God, the real Christ, the real Jesus, and they say, I don't like that. That's hostility. They're, they're saying, I don't like that God. That's not the God that I want to associate with. That's not the God that I want to identify with. And that's a hostility. That's, that's, a, that's a, a wrong way of thinking. And so when presented with the truth and they deny the truth of what's laid out in Scripture, that is a hostility. It doesn't have to be a hostility where somebody is thinking dark thoughts about, about God. You, you, you can have somebody who's just very calmly and very plainly inside and out say, eh, I disagree with that. That's a thought of hostility to the person of God as laid out in Scripture. Okay. Now. The hostility of mind can be can be huffy puffy or it can be whatever it else. But the, the main idea is, is that they do not have a right thought about the God of the Bible and what they think of the God of the Bible. They say, I don't like him. And so there you have hostility in mind. OK. That's what you have now. Not only a hostility in mind, but hostility in deed as well. And I think that's how the whole thing connects there. Where it talks about, it says, um, uh, and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. You know, our evil deeds, man's evil deeds is an expression of their hostility toward God. Whether they have God literally on their minds at that point when they're when they're uh, when they're acting out their sin, whether they have that in their God on their mind or not, any evil deed is hostile towards God. Okay. Now I want to take you to Romans chapter eight just real quick, because Romans chapter eight just kind of gives us a good display of this, um, where it links the the hostility and and the deeds together. Um, in Romans chapter eight, notice what it says there in, um, in verse seven, it says for the mind, for the mind, notice this, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not listen for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 
And then verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, this is in contrast to what Paul has, Paul has said before about the mindset on the spirit. And I believe that the idea here is those because it is, is the whole the whole idea is, is contrasting people who are believers and who are not believers. People who don't have the spirit have their mindset on the flesh and their minds are hostile to God. And did you notice the connection that it said there? So it says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Why? For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Okay. The, the hostility, the, the hostility is ma- towards God and in the mind is manifest in a failure to submit to God's law. Okay. It's a failure to submit to what God says one should do or not doing what God says that one should not do. Okay. And so when people sin, that's the, that's an expression of hostility toward God, whether they have a conscious mind of it or not. Now, again, the, the whole thing of the, the issue of sin and talking about sin and somebody's hostility toward, towards God can be brought to the surface just when somebody talks about what they think of sin. You know, somebody might think, well, I don't have an inner hatred for God or anything like that. And then let's say you say to that person, well, the Bible has, has a lot to say about fornication, sex outside of marriage. And then somebody says, oh, you know, that's, you know, no, that's, that's not fair. Or no, that's, you know, you're, you're, you're talking, you're talking nonsense now about this whole thing of, of speaking against fornication. And, you know, as long as people love each other, as long as they love each other, it, it shouldn't be a problem. In fact, I'm going to, to go to my girlfriend's house and we're going to have sex there and, and, and things like that. We're not married, but we love each other and we're going to we're going to do that sort of thing. That's hostility. Somebody might not be yelling and screaming or somebody might not be angry or 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 inwardly passionate about something. But the fact that they would say or even live the lifestyle in the sense that fornication is is uh, is not bad. That's hostility towards God, because, you know, the the law and what he lays forth is in some way a re- of a reflection of who he is. And that gets back to the whole thing of all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of sin and fall short of looking like God. Okay. So when somebody says, even says, we're not even talking about, whoops, knock down my water here. Um, when somebody says, um, I don't agree with that. I don't agree. I don't agree that this is a sin. That's another expression of hostility because God says one thing and then somebody else says, no, I don't agree with that at all. So there you see, you, you see the whole thing of, of hostility. And so that's what, that's what, uh, that's what, that's what Paul lays forth here. And this is, this is where we all were before we came to, before we came to Christ friends. This is, this is where we all, this is where we all were. Okay. No matter what our background, no matter what our, our upbringing and, and, and everything, and even even if we're talking about people who came to Christ at a young age, maybe you don't ever remember being a, a hostile toward God, but let's let's look at it this way. If left to your own devices, you would definitely go that direction. You would definitely go that direction because that's part of your sin, your, that's part of your sin nature. Your sin nature naturally takes you away from God and from the things of God because you're spiritually dead. You're, you're not responsive to those sorts of things. Okay, so that's verse 21, okay, of Colossians 1. And he says, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, verse 22, he, Christ, has now reconciled, there's our word, reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Okay, now let's let's pause right there for a moment. Okay, so... It says there, um, he has he has now uh, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. In other words, that you know, just by the death of Christ. And I think one of the reasons why he might be bringing this whole thing a body of flesh is because you know that might be as a result of uh, of what you know, some prevailing things that are starting to crop up with Gnosticism and even with what people were saying about Jesus himself and mixing that whole thing with Gnosticism since they thought that the body was evil 
um, they were saying that Jesus didn't really have a body. Um, it was a, a Serinthian sort of thing, which comes from Serinthius, who, uh, um, who uh, am I getting that right? Was that him who said that, that, uh, um, that God never had a, had a real body? Whatever, uh, whatever, whatever the case may be, there was a term called docetism, which comes from the, uh, from the Greek word dokeia, which means to seem, which, would, which says that, um, that, that Jesus seemed to have a body but didn't have a real body which of course flies in the face of the gospel because Jesus had to be human because if he was going to give his life for, for sinful humans, he had to be, he himself had to be human as well. So maybe that's why he, he majors on that whole thing of body of flesh. But the whole thing is, is this is all by his death. Okay. So uh, he, so in other words, so basically this is what you can say, and this isn't anything that's earth shattering or anything as, like that. This is that by the death of Christ, reconciliation is possible. And of course, if we understand how God, how God looks and views that sin, we, we see why that is. Because if, if Jesus died for our sins and he died to take away our sins, he now opens up the way for that relationship to be possible. So the death of Christ is the means by which reconciliation is made possible. Okay. And he has now reconciled us in his body of flesh by his death in order that you, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Okay. Now we're not going to go into detail there. That actually touches on another aspect of the gospel that we're, that we want to talk about, which we're going to talk about later sometime down the road. I don't know exactly when, but we'll get back to that. But notice but that's just the the layout of reconciliation as it's laid out in scripture there in that passage now of course you can go to other places uh in rec with reconciliation but here's the thing that w that we have to understand okay so we were hostile towards god we were enemies of him now the fact that we are enemies of god you know and we and if we understand who god is we understand that there's nothing that of us where we deserve to be brought back into right relationship with god god would have been totally um, righteous to leave that relationship in the bad state and to condemn us all to, to eternal punishment. He could have done that, but because of his love for us. And again, that comes back to the love issue. Remember we talked about the love of God a few weeks ago, God sent forth his son to die on the cross for our sins, to take away our sins so that by faith in him, we could be brought back together into right relationship. And he's given us eternal life. So remember when we looked at John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, here's the thing with eternal life, because I and I hinted at this last time. Eternal life is more than just a, a quantity of life. We think about we think about eternal life. We think about we we think about the length of time. We think eternal, right? A never ending never ending life. And so, you know, a lot of people think, okay, so, you know, from this point on, I'm, I'm forever, I'm, I'm going to exist forever. Um, even when I die, my body might be dead, but I'm with the Lord in heaven. And so I continue to exist forever in heaven. Um, that's true. But I mean, if we think about, if we just think about eternal life, uh, just relating to quantity of time, we have to come to the understanding that even unbelievers have eternal life if that's how we're going to define it right if we're just talking about eternal life as just you know just a forever existence then that's the same thing for unbelievers too because unbelievers who don't have uh, accept christ in this life and they die they continue to exist right you know, we, the Bible doesn't teach anything about annihilationism or anything like that. There's eternal punishment in Hades. And then when Christ comes back, there's the whole thing where they're tossed into the lake of fire. And, 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 they, and they're in eternal judgment, eternal torment in hell. So they are eternally existent. So we know that eternal life is more than just meaning eternal existence, right? It, it means something more, Okay. And what it means is it, it means it, 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 it you know, bra being brought into that right relationship. Eternal life has a lot to do with relationship. I mean, there's other things that you can say about eternal life, the eternal life for the believer. But one of the big things that it, that it speaks of is the whole thing of relationship. Now, if you were to look at John chapter 17, okay, 
um, John chapter 17 um, I'm going to start at verse 1 verse 3 is the is the uh, is the main verse there but I'm going to start at verse 1 and read through verse 3 okay it says and this is in the upper room um, Jesus and his disciples well some people say that this isn't in the upper room this is in the garden we don't have to talk about that but whatever the case wherever it is this is Jesus praying to God the Father in the in the in the presence of his disciples so it says in, in chapter 17 it says when Jesus had spoken these words he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have get, to all uh, whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, when we look at this whole thing of, of eternal life, um, the element is it, what we want to say about eternal life is that yes, it, it does speak of a quantity of life, but with but with eternal life, there's an extra thing added to it. There's 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 a quality of life to it as well. Okay, now the interesting thing about about this about John chapter seventeen verse uh, verse three um, is that when you look at the original language in the Greek. Um, because let me, let me, let me back up. Let me say this. A lot of people look at, at chapter 17, verse three of John and say this, Jesus is giving the definition of eternal life. And in a sense he is, but it's, it's, it's more of a, a it's more of a, a, a statement of purpose. Um, when he says, um, and, uh, and this is, um, and this is eternal life that they may know you when he says that they, that they know um, in the original, there's the there's a word hina, plus the word for no, which is in the subjunctive, which gives the idea that this is a purpose statement. Um, and so it's almost as if he's saying, and this is the purpose of eternal life. He's already said that that he gives eternal life to those whom the Father has given him, and the purpose behind eternal life is that they may know you, the true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, what's this whole thing with with knowing? Because the word relationship doesn't show up there. But the word is know that you that they may know you the true God and Jesus whom you have sent, right? Now, if you read scripture, the the thing that you understand about knowing is that knowing in the Bible a lot of times doesn't so much have to do solely with cognitive mental knowledge. All right. That's not necessarily what we're dealing with. Jesus isn't saying eternal life. The purpose of eternal life is so that you can, uh, that you have a built up data database of facts about God. Now, knowing about God, for example, knowing the attributes of God and things like that is important. I'm not saying that that's not, but I'm just saying that that's a lot of times when you look at scripture, the whole thing of knowing uh, is supposed to convey intimate knowledge, intimate knowledge, which which conveys an intimate relationship. So, again, what we're what we're what we're majoring on here is the relationship. okay? and so that's and so that's that's what you have there. So, um, for example, to uh, highlight what it looks like for someone to not have a relationship with Christ. You remember in, in the, um, in the sermon on the Mount where, uh, where Jesus says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my father in heaven. Um, when the people, when, uh, when the objectors will say, we, we prophesied your name, we drove out demons in your name and, and that sort of thing. Jesus said on that day, he will say to them, I never knew you. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that he just had no knowledge of them whatsoever or had, had, had no knowledge of their existence? No, Jesus knows their existence. But what he says is that I never had a relationship with you, a, 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 a intimate relationship. That's the whole idea with knowledge or knowing somebody. Depending on what translation you use, when you look at places like um, Genesis 4, when it talks about Adam and Eve, it says Adam knew Eve and then out popped Cain. <laughs> now, now, does that now I know um, just based on nature and just even going back to eighth grade sex education, that knowledge of somebody doesn't produce pregnancy. 
If that were the case, uh, the, the world would be much more fuller of human beings than it is right now, <laughs> right? You know, so what is that talking about? It's talking about an intimacy there. Now that, and now in that case, in that context, it's talking about of a sexual kind. But, but basically what we're talking about with knowledge is that we're talking about an intimate relationship there. Now, if we talk about this whole thing of intimacy, because we think about if we're, if we're really in tune with our relationship with God, and we think, man, we love the intimacy. Um, what we have to understand about this is that when we're talking about reconciliation, where we're hostile towards God, now we're in relationship with him. What do we have now that we didn't have before? We have peace, right? Peace. The other way to put this is the war between you and God is over, okay? Paul says as much in Romans chapter 5, okay? So if you if we were to look at Romans chapter 5 here, I'm having a hard time turning my pages here. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 where it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Now, again, this isn't the peace. This isn't the peace of God where there's this inner tranquility. Now, of course, I think that we can claim that having the peace of God, but this is peace with God. That's what that passage says. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? That means before we didn't have peace with God. What did we have? We had enmity with God. We were hostile towards God. And then if you go go down later there in, in verse 10 of Romans chapter 5, it says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. There again is the whole thing. By the death of his son, reconciliation was brought forth. For if, if while we were enemies... There's that word. We were enemies. We were we were reconciled to God by the death of, of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Okay. Now I want to I want to mention something about the last part of that that phrase there in verse uh, in verse 10 here in a little bit. But I want you to see the whole thing here. There's enmity, there's hostility before, and now with reconciliation, what we have is peace. The war is over. But now when you when you bring in the whole thing of relationship, you see the whole concept of relationship ups the ante a little bit, you know, because you see you can have, you know, you can have peace with somebody, but not have a relationship with them. Same thing geopolitically. You can have a country that has peace uh, there, you know, for a, from a treaty or, or, or something like that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they become instant allies. Right. And when we're talking about peace, we're, you know, when in, in the peace of God, and then we bring relationship into this, we understand that this is more than just a temporary ceasefire. Okay. A ceasefire doesn't necessarily signal peace. When we have peace, what we have is not just a, 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 a ceasing of hostilities, but we have a relationship that's brought into this. Now, I want to take the whole thing of relationship and bring this further into into what kind of relationship because I mean like what form does this does this relationship take? What does it take? What does this look like? Now, the relationship between the Christian and God can can be described in several different ways, I mean just based on what scripture talks about. But I think one of the one of the greatest illustrations and the greatest terms that is used of this is the relationship between father and son. Now you're really now you're really getting into the to the great wonder of this whole thing of reconciliation. Because the war is over. There's peace, but not only there is there just peace, but now there's relationship. And the and the function and the and the form of that relationship now has the has this has this uh manifestation of of a relationship between father and son. Okay? Now, if you were to look at John chapter one, and I think we looked at this a few weeks ago, um, but I just want to bring it to your attention again um, in verses uh, verses uh, starting in verse 10 of John chapter one, it says he was he was in the world. Christ It's talking about Christ. He was in the world and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. 
Notice that. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He gave, that's, that's amazing. He gave them the right to become children of God, the right. Now, I want to say something here that's very important because I, I've heard per people from time to time uh, talk about things rather inaccurately here when it comes to this. Because, uh, you know, I've heard some people say all of us, and, he's just, and they're just talking about all people in this world. We're all children of God. Actually, no, that's not the case. So when people say all of us are, are we're all God's children. No, that's not true. Now, to be fair, I wonder if some of those people, when they say that, when they're saying that, they're just saying that we have all been created by God. If that's what they're meaning by that, then in a sense, that's true. Even Paul uh, lays that out um, in Acts 17. He says, we are all his offspring. But if we're talking about children of God, where, where, uh, where we can, where uh, there's a father child relationship. No, that's not open to everybody. Okay. That's not open to everybody. Everybody can't make that claim that I am a child of God. They can say that they are created in God's image, but that's different from having a father child relationship. When you have people who reject Christ and are hostile towards God, that's not a, that's not a, a, a situation where, where you're dealing with somebody who is a child of God. What John says there in John chapter one is that through faith in his name, he has given us the right to become children of God. So if people don't come to Christ by faith, what does that mean? They don't have any right to be called children of God or to call themselves children of God. So the whole thing of we are all God's children is, is not, is not true. Now this might be a, a little bit of a small sort of thing. And you know, some people might think that I'm, that I'm being a little nitpicky here, but Really, I think this is important, just really understanding the terminology and the terms that we use. Um, I don't I don't like in mixed company, and by mixed company I'm saying in the in the group of believers and non believers, um, recite having everybody recite the the, the Lord's Prayer. Because the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father who art in heaven. Now if we're just dealing with a room full of people and people are saying our Father who art in heaven, they have people are saying thing praying things that aren't true. I don't know if you remember last year, the whole thing with uh, Melania Trump. Um, I don't remember where they were, but it was, I think it was some sort of rally of some sort. And she opened up the time by leading everybody in the Lord's Prayer. Um, now, she got some uh, some criticism from that from, from people in the media, and that's to be expected. Um, I don't think that the, the angle that they were coming from and criticizing her was, was fair. I don't think that was fair at all. Now, from a spiritual perspective, and you had people on the conservative side and particularly Christians who were saying, that's just awesome what Melania Trump did. Um, I'm going to take a different stance um, and I'm not going to say, go out on a limb and say that the first lady sinned or anything like that. It's not a matter of doing something wrong necessarily. It's just like... I don't know. It just when you have a room full of people, this is just a regular old rally. This isn't a, a, a meeting of Christians. So you have a whole bunch of people there. You have probably had some Christians in there, but to lead people in that prayer where everybody is there saying our father who are in heaven, you have people who are saying our father who are not children of God. Our relationship, if you're a Christian, your relationship with God is on a much different level than people of the world. Now, does that mean that God doesn't love people of the world? No, it doesn't mean that at all. We looked at that a few weeks ago when we looked at the love of God. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son. But now you get to claim a father-child relationship with God that is so much closer, so much deeper, so much more intimate, so much more abundant than what the world can claim. And what's true of the world, people who are outside of Christ, they are living in hostility towards God. But now through Christ, there's an acceptance. The war is over. 
relationship is on and it's a relationship that lasts forever okay now that's important to 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 point out as well because when we struggle some of some people may struggle with this with this whole idea of a father of thinking of God as father simply because some of you may have grown up in households where you had a messed up childhood and you had a father who was abusive or neglectful or in that sort of thing um and it's and it's harder for you to wrap your arms around this whole thing of 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 God as a father and you look at God as the father in, this, in your as your father in the same way that your earthly father was um and let me just tell you tell you that God in his perfection is not like your your evil father right Jesus even says as much in 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 Matthew chapter 7 we don't have to go into that much but I mean when we're talking about the permanent relationship of the father we're talking about a father who does not neglect his children okay the, the, the relationship, the closest, the, intim- the intimacy is permanent, which is important to it's a, which is important to understand because when you have people who are struggling with sin and they're and they're and they're grieving over it and they and they and they and they want and they want and they desire that holiness um, in Christ. Sometimes they might wonder. We talked about this a few weeks ago too, um, where you might wonder, does God love me anymore, or has God turned His back on me? Listen. Listen again to to what Paul says in in Romans chapter five verse ten. We we saw it a few minutes ago. It says, "For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more." See, I like I like how 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 that term shows up in Scripture. Now you see it, you you see the connection that he's going to try and make there that hinges on like on that on that term much more. Because again, he says, while while we were enemies, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. In other words, this whole thing was made possible by the death of his son. But the death of Christ didn't remain just a death, right? What happened three days later? Jesus rose from the dead. So Jesus is alive and his life is now part of our life because we are in union with him. And what that means is, is that in relationship, he continues to, to develop us and to mold us and he continues to work with us even in our not so good moments. Now, some of that comes by conviction. Some of that comes by discipline. And that again is where people make the stumble because when they're convicted or they're being, there's discipline of some sort, People might think, okay, God has turned his back on me. God doesn't love me and that sort of thing. What you're, what, you're de- what you're dealing with is people who are saying the relationship is off. As if God said, that's it. I've had it with this person. Okay? And that's not true. That's a lie. Don't mistake conviction and discipline for, for something that something good that God is doing in your life. Now, I want to call to your attention um, Hebrews in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, um, it says, consider, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against, him, uh, against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not, re- you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And then he quotes from scripture here, uh, uh, from Proverbs, it says, and my, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord, deci- excuse me, the, for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Right. So in those times, he's treating you as sons. Now, listen to what he goes on to say. I wish we could go into this in more detail, um, but for time's sake, we won't. But just I'm just going to read it here where it says it is for it is for discipline that you have that you have to. End- Excuse me. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Uh, God is treating you as sons for what son is there who is uh, uh, whom his father does not discipline. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have uh, besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. 
Shall we not much more be, is there that word again, much more be subject to the father of spirits and live for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. That's awesome. He does it for a purpose, not to, not to smite us, not to do anything like that, but to, so that we can share in his holiness. Verse 11, for the moment, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So you look at this whole thing as a, as a, as a from a perspective of a father who's training his son. So listen, another way to put it is this, if God didn't love you and didn't care for you, he just lets you go on, right? What seems to be said here in Hebrews is that he does this for a purpose, for your own good, to bring you back into back into the path of holiness, so that you can yield the fruit of righteousness as as you as you've been called to do. And he says that's what a father does. A father trains his child. If that doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen on a regular basis, you know what that means? That means that's a maybe a good indication that you are an illegitimate child. And we th- now, if you're a Christian, you hear that. You say, "Oh, I, that's awful." If, if we're if we're illegitimate children of God. But I say all of this just to just to remind you and to show you that don't let Satan spoil your lunch because he might try and get you to to think that God doesn't love you anymore. The relationship has been severed. And that's and that's something else. We need to be very careful of our vocabulary because some people say when we sin, the, re, the relationship between us and God is broken. I don't I don't like that term. I, I get what they're trying to say, um, but. Let's choose our words a little bit more carefully. The relationship isn't broken. I think it's more accurate to say that the harmony within the relationship is broken and that we need to confess our sins to restore harmony in the relationship, but the relationship itself isn't broken. That's not what we're dealing with at all. And so, um, and so that's how uh, that's, but a lot of times, sometimes people, when they sin, they feel like the relationship is broken. Then they say the relationship is broken. Now, what can I do to restore my relationship? You're not restoring the relationship. The relationship has already been restored. The relationship was restored when you came to Christ in faith. Okay. That's what you're dealing with, but you're restoring harmony in the relationship. And that's what you're dealing with. That's what you're really wrestling with. When you sin and the loss of harmony is there, that's what many people struggle with, but they take it to an unnecessary extreme. When there's conviction, or even when there's discipline, because God does deal with us when we when we sin a lot of times. But it's not because he's suddenly against us. He is so definitely for you. And it's because he f- he's for you that he goes after you. And so the writer of Hebrews says, don't despise that. He's treating you as, as sons. Just as our father, just as just as for me, for example, I got my I got my butt spanked from time to time here and there. Not every day or not very often, but there are times where I got my butt spanked <laughs> as a kid growing up, right? Um, now, my dad did that for my own good. He didn't do that because he hated me. And any other any other children, uh, you know, fathers or parents who spank their kids, um, if they're doing it in the, for the right reason, I know some people don't do that correctly, but, you know, for assuming it's for the right reasons and at the right time, they do it beca- out of love for their, for, for their child. You know, so we have to understand that. And so that goes into the whole thing of relationship. And so we should be joyful that we have a father, a father who we're not, we're not, we're not enemies anymore. And when we do have a lack of harmony and God comes after us, he does it for our good. And that all the more shows the healthy relationship that there is between us and God than in anything else. And so I hope you take encouragement by that. I hope you, I hope you really, I hope they really latch on to that whole concept. So again, just to, as we, as we bring this to a close, what we have here, we have peace with God. We, well, we started out as enemies who are hostile towards God We're enemies, right? But now through faith in Christ, we now have peace. The war is over. And we're not just talking about a temporary ceasefire. We're talking about true, genuine peace where the war is over. And the war is over. But the war, it's just not a fact that the war is over. It's the fact that the war is over and now we have relationship, right 
harmonious, intimate relationship with the person that we were at war with before. And that relationship, what that looks like is a relationship between a father and a son or a father and a daughter. If you're a woman, obviously a father and his child. And that relationship is permanent. Listen, God's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. Even when you're at your worst, he's not going anywhere. That is your father, friends. That is your father. That is your spiritual daddy. I mean, I just want you to I just want you to think about that. That's tremendous. The God of the universe is your father. And you know what? Going back to what we talked about before, he loves you so much. More than words can really dis- explain or describe. And all of that, the, har- the harmony, the intimacy, the relationship, the ceasing of war is all made possible by the gospel, by the death of the Son of God, taking our sins, putting it upon himself so that you could do away with sin so that barrier to relationship can be done away with. And so that now, through Christ and faith in him, we can enter into that relationship. I just think that that's amazing. It's truly, truly amazing. So let that settle in your hearts, in your minds. Let it ruminate. I truly hope that you're blessed by that wonderful truth. Okay. All right. So we'll end it there. Um, Obviously, next time uh, when we get back together, we'll we'll continue in the book of Acts. I anticipate what we'll do is we'll cover the next couple chapters. So chapter 12 and chapter 13. We got some good things in store, especially especially next week when we start looking at at, at chapter twelve. Um, there's a very important lesson on prayer um, that I think that it, that's very valuable for us to learn, and it's a and it's a lesson that um, that might be more than what you expect. I mean, when you read the text of Acts twelve, you might be familiar with what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna, but there's there's more to that 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 we need to that we need to uncover. Um, with that. And I think that, that that it'll be truly valuable to learn about that from that text. That's just one element, though. There's a lot in, in chapter 12. Basically, what we're going to look at is Peter's great escape from prison. So we see that persecution, animosity, and and, and um, things, uh, uh, hostilities toward the church is, is starting to ramp up again. Now, we've been here before. We're going to see it again, um, but we're going to see God at work, okay? God is at work, and God works in ways, and I think this would be seen from the perspective of the church that was praying for Peter when he was locked up, God works in ways that we do not expect him. And so therefore we cannot put God in a box. Now I'm going to explain all of that when we get to that. You know, I'm just I'm just throwing out tidbits there of just what we're going to look at, but that's really what we're going that the, what we're going to be dealing with that and much more. Um we're I'm going to try and cover all of chapter 12 since chapter 12 is all one story. It's kind of it's kind of clunky and 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 um, awkward if we if we break that up. And I think that we can um, look at that passage of, of Acts chapter twelve in one podcast episode, and then we'll probably take uh, a few uh, um, uh, episodes in chapter thirteen because chapter thirteen is a long chapter. We'll see when we get there. You know, I'm just making guesses here as I'm as I'm thinking through this whole thing, but. But anyway, so Acts chapter 12 next time, have that in your mind. Just hopefully that's a good teaser. Just some things that we learn about prayer prayer and God working beyond our expectations. Okay. So I think what you're going to see next time is going to be something that's very, very cool. We're going to put God on display as we always try and do here, but it's going to be something in a very cool way and you don't want to miss that. Okay. So. If you like this show, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on iTunes. Also, uh, check me out on Twitter. My uh, handle, uh, Loving the Scriptures on Twitter, my handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S C R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. All right, I've enjoyed my time with you. I always do. Um, it's, uh, like I said, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're in store for some wonderful things um, down the line. I'm very confident of that. But until next time, my name is Steve Gill, and I hope to see you here next time. Bye now.